Um, so we have another Uniting Conversations and Actions discussion tonight and well tonight my time tonight here in Melbourne. I'd like to give a warm welcome to Jamie J. Hagen. Um, and I'm never sure, Jamie, if I should do some kind of like, oh, she's this amazing, prestigious person, or if I'm going like, oh, here's Jamie, the cat lover. How would you like to describe yourself? <laughs> um, yeah, I'm happy to be a person who's talking about queer stuff in security spaces. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, no, that's great. And you do, you do talk about... Um, you know, security, you talk about queer stuff. Um, and I guess that's my first question is queer is a pretty high OECD country kind of term. Um, and there's different terminology that we use around. And there's LGBTIQ plus um, within edge effect, we use diverse OGSC. And I guess in terms of women, peace and security, that first step of going, well, who under the LGBTIQ community are we talking about? Are we talking about everyone? Yeah, when I use queer, you mean? Yeah, like, and, and using the term as well. And yeah, just, I mean, I certainly mean it. I don't think it necessarily gets used in that way. And I think that the, like, one of the critiques and the really important contributions that feminists have made, and I'm, by no means the first, I mean, there's decades of pointing this out that in using the way that gender is used to mean women. And then, you know, I do see the, the conversation that I'm a part of is um, directly related to the activism that's sort of saying you're, you're missing a big, uh, a lot of, of women and also you're falling into like a really problematic binary um, in a lot of this work. So I think um, I, you know, from from the very the way that I initially started conceiving of the project was to see the violence side of it. So to say, like, what's going on with not understanding uh, transphobic and homophobic violence. So in that sense, I'm of course like seeing all the people who would be at the end, uh, the receiving end mm -hmm. of this violence. But at the same time, we understand that if we break apart, um, you don't actually have to be queer to experience homophobic and transphobic <laughs> violence. <laughs> So to me, like in having this queering conversation, um, it's about people who are openly identifying as LGBTQ, people who may not use those categories, but if we understand that, you know, it's, it's meant to be about reframing how we think gender works. Mm -hmm. Because for me, when I hear gender, I'm always thinking about sexuality too. I, I, I can't talk about gender without also thinking about sex and sexuality. Uh -huh. But that became evident to me that, that that's not true for a lot of folks. And in fact, people are really, I don't know, I almost want to say the word triggered to, to talk about sex and sexuality as if like let us just like get some women in the room and like get some some progress in that way and then maybe we can start talking about the lesbians right mm. that's where it all narrows down to right like yeah. let's not talk about the lesbians yet um so I very much say like I'm talking about lesbians I'm talking about bisexuals I'm, I'm talking about um trans folks but um at the same time like I just chaired this panel where it was uh, it included people presenting research from Colombia and people presenting research from Mexico and the folks working on the Colombian paper were like they ended up putting queer in their title but actually queer isn't what they use in their analysis and I was kind of like why did you do that and you can tell that it's that work of trying to be seen in certain spaces as like being part of the conversation so I'd be interested to like hear more about like the trade-offs of sort of like when you use queer when you don't like what the you know what the footnotes end up looking like because I mean there's mm. always you know footnotes <laughs> or like an entire glossary yeah. um of sort of what the terms mean which I don't I think is great personally I think it's and also like I mean I, I, there I, I'd be kind of curious to sort of like in the next like after five more years to sort of make a like like a review of the different glossaries or the different terms that I've used because I have very different, like in the first, in the first book chapter I wrote, you know, I had a glossary and it would be, I wouldn't put that same glossary in some, in my, you know, book, mm -hmm. right? Like I just would have different, I would, mm -hmm. I would describe um, these terms and differently, right? Yeah. Um, Certainly so yeah, we've I, had our own, our own 
progress over time and evolution over time of what terms we use and how we use them. Um, I guess the question that around queer, like if we're talking about women, peace and security, and so what we're talking about are, are often places of conflict and they're often places that are non-Western as such. And so, you know, I guess there's the LGBTIQ and then, um, you know, is that an appropriate term to be using here? But then also if we're thinking about women, peace and security, one of the big questions I have, and I think that we've spoken about this before is, well, where are lesbian women, where are bisexual women, particularly within that broader humanitarian context, what we're seeing in research in all sorts of things coming to the forefront that there is a bias towards trans women and gay men only through, um, I guess, visibility from HIV in development programming for, you know, which was much needed. And so if we're going to talk about women, peace and security, I guess, is there, is there a need to think about LBQ and uh, women as well as trans women, which I think, because there's such a backlash too against women, peace and security, I think we have to fight for our trans sisters to be included a little bit more. Um, I, before when you said um, when you think of gender, you think of the difference between gender and sexuality. And every time someone says the word to me, I think what you're talking about is traditional notions of gender. You're talking about what you perceive as cisgendered heterosexual women. Um, and that's a little thing that goes through my mind every time I hear that word. Mm. I think a lot of people are, which is why my like, I, I'm, I'm pretty obsessed with people like talking through what they think they're talking about when they say gender. Mm. And I think that's where really fascinating and necessary conversations are happening because obviously people who are anti-trans are very viscerally violent about like what they think is and isn't gender, which is like um, not reflective of people's lived experience with really mm. damaging implications. But mm. at the same time, I think that people, in my experience, I sort of think that the accountability to sort of like not being very intentionally trans inclusive mm. in in doing women peace and security work or just sort of like being a gender advisor mm. is is a real gap yeah and i think that that's so in some senses i think that the response has been in a lot of places like oh great we need an lgbtq program we need to do like this separate thing mm. We need lots of different approaches. That's fine. Fund an LGBTQ mm. program. But if you have the same folks who are doing the gender work, not, not actually being committed and working with trans rights and being educated and committed, you know, like if that, mm. educated and committed to that being part of their work, mm. then you're reproducing the same mm. violence. And I, and, I, and, I, and I think also as I've, like when I started doing the research I was doing, I, I was kind of like, what's going on that people are, I mean, obviously there is a really violent backlash. There are very, there's mm. lots of evidence of anti-trans um, hate, um, but I, you know what is also the impact of of, of initiatives that just kind of are not explicitly trans inclusive and in, and in, and in reaching out to groups and and learning from and learning with these groups to mm. to me is sort of the thing that that I that I've always sort of sort of really st stuck with and I think to me it also you know, tracing more of the history of what happens when we're not intentionally anti-racist is you end up with a lot of mm -hmm. um, reproducing violent racial hierarchies with a lot of, you know, privileged people in, in some of these various transnational feminist organizations, transnational human rights organizations. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think I think what I've seen is sort of like more LGBTQ people coming into the spaces saying, let's talk about this. And, the, and you know, that maps with other human rights work, right? Mm -hmm. You get some queer people who can get into the room or maybe have enough privilege and the ability to sort of say like, by the way, mm -hmm. there's lesbians in the room too. And sort mm -hmm. of what do we think about that? Um, but yeah, I think that as, as there is this like recognition of anti-gender backlash uh I do think there's a bit I do think there's a bit of scrambling 
to sort of see like, okay, well, what, what does this mean if we take up trans rights considering we have no, <laughs> we haven't really worked on this folks. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, you, you must be experiencing this because people are like, I need to get trained up. I need to like, we, we, this is, this is a problem. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I do think it comes against like the fundamental, like what is women, peace and security doing? In what I, you know, if I'm going to remain optimistic about women, peace and security in any capacity, and obviously there's lots of reasons to be really critical and skeptical of it, it is to sort of see this as a space that could be intentionally um, like working to, uh, you know, have coalitional initiatives that include women who are not <laughs> just, um, cis and straight yeah. <laughs> right? yeah um but yeah. yeah i'm curious i mean this is all like so this is the, this is this is what i like to talk about right this is what i do talk about and i see people being responsive and saying yes we need to do this tell me what comes up in these i mean obviously don't tell on anyone but like when you're in these training spaces i'm curious sort of like are you getting a lot of the like aha like absolutely or are you getting the like well that's not really what we do sort of thing you know no. <laughs> I think it's, a, it's a mixture I think in in some of the training spaces particularly when I'm you know one training that I do and I work in and it's it's specifically pitched at, at an endpoint of gender and how to include queer women and I don't use that term but how do I include queer women in traditional gender programming and I think that you know people that do go through it do have an aha moment I think some of the challenges for me, and of course, you know, the edge effect is more broad humanitarian and development. Right. I think that the people that get that ha-ha and the people that have come are already invested. They already, um, mm. they already care about it. And then they're individual champions, sometimes queer, sometimes not, often, <laughs> often queer, but not always, um, that are in their organisations and they're, you know, don't really speak for that organisation and can't really right. push deeper inclusion within that organisation. And I think that's probably some of the challenges that I face. Um, but I do realise that we just dived straight into this deep yeah, conversation. I mean, we we spiraled and jumbled that, doing that because <laughs> that's you and I. But we do have um, a few attendees. So we'll pull back a little bit and also invite people, if you have any questions, put it in the chat box. Um, but I guess really what we're talking about is how we can better include LGBT voices, but also center, I guess, LGBT CSOs in the work that they're already doing. And I think that that's something right. that you and I both independently think about and, and try and, and ponder on how do we do that? Um, and the importance of doing that, I think that gap of maybe why there's so much barrier to that and, so little resource to that is, you know, part of my advocacy is convincing people why that's why that's necessary in the first place. What, you know, what do they bring to the table? Um, how do you get over that barrier? Do you see that barrier? The barrier of LGBTQ organizations not being, wait, am I understanding that correctly? That, that they're um, not sure CSOs they're bringing... not being included. Um, so I guess in centering their voices in, in women, peace and security or in any okay. kind of security context or humanitarian context, I guess those yeah, I mean, CSOs I guess and the, feminist ones too. I, I mean, I guess I haven't had the experience of talking to organizations that have been reaching out and kind of been rebuffed, I guess, because mm -hmm. I've, I've been on the side of really advocating that those because the rooms I'm in are usually the ones where I'm invited because it's a women, peace and security space, right? So I'm just like, you can't like this is this is why to me it's so much about like have you reached out explicitly do you not know who to reach out to okay well let's talk about this let's sort of figure out who the people you can work with are and this to me is what you know it, it links up directly with how I think about teaching too like I think we need to really embrace what we don't know and and like especially when there's really dire consequences and there's a dire consequence for not knowing and uh, you know which CSOs are out there working on um, responding to queerphobia. And 
and I don't mean to suggest like, oh, just get on the internet and Google it because we know that's not how it works, especially <laughs> in places that are um, dealing with ongoing violent conflict at the same time. Um, it, yeah, so this is why it's like a long-term commitment. And, and, so who, and so I think you and I have been talking about this, like what does it mean to have this community of practice and I do think it's an important moment for investment from like, I, my perspective on it is that there's an opportunity and need for a, an investment in helping to facilitate these networks so that it isn't on the back of a small group that probably is underfunded and definitely in crisis that never forget about a con like the ongoing conflict, right? <laughs> forget about the fact that there's riots in Belfast, like there's no trans healthcare, you know? <laughs> like, so how do we make sure that it's not like, how are, you know, how sending an email when you hear about the latest crisis, mm -hmm. but that there's like ongoing uh, work and there's, you know, mm -hmm. uh, a community of practice between different groups of, of activists doing this work that can also like we do need the networks of people to I mean this is my view you I think it is helpful to have networks where someone can say like actually be careful because this person's transphobic and be careful about that because I, and and that's something that uh, there's going there is a significant hierarchy here about you know okay so one of the big organizations invites you in um you're an organization that hasn't worked with them before who do you turn to to ask sort of like is this a is this is this a good partner to work with hmm. and this is something that um again like I, i'm concerned about and see in my position of of like in academia and, and and in policy work with wanting to get you know the voices in to, to talk and that's really important of course but um I'm I'm really interested, especially since it sounds like you've heard from folks that are kind of like getting being told like, well, we're not doing that work. That's not what we do. Um, yeah, how do you sort of like bridge that divide? And also, you know, it, it is very like I think that's why the network between the the CSOs and and, and individual individual activists in a lot of cases, right, um, mm -hmm. is so important because. Um, I'm also thinking like there's a lot of these alliances that probably shouldn't happen at this at this point or maybe ever because we know about the way that some of this work is extractive and and like the violent repercussions that if you're in this in this hierarchical relationship where who are, who are you going to report the the mm -hmm. bad behavior to? I mean I don't I mean we're I don't know how much you want to speak to that but I think we also don't have I, from what I've seen, I mean, how, who would you report that to and how mm. would that sort of, you know, and so yeah. at the same time that we're, that I think it's really important to advocate for the reaching out and working with, I think there also needs mm. to be networks where people can sort of work in solidarity so that they're not kind of like the one lone person representing. <laughs> and one point in between there that I'm curious about how you've seen folks be able to navigate this is I'm talking to increasingly, I'm talking to more people who are sort of like, in exile and they want to be someone who can kind of be like okay so i'm in london and i'm i'm, I'm doing research and i want to continue working with um folks in lebanon or wherever but i'm feeling really excluded from that activist space because they're just in this like middle area of of not knowing how to sort of like be in community so i don't know if you i'd be curious if you've sort of seen ways that folks or if anyone in the audience can speak to sort of how people have have like navigated being that it's that you know that insider outsider space that in some ways I think is really crucial to navigating and and bridging these these conversations. But um, again, without like the sort of support to be able to do that, um, mm -hmm. I, I wonder how we sort of like move through uh, how we can kind of support that and, and and move through those those relationships in, in meaningful ways and and I I just feel like these are the conversations that you and I have been having as mm. we're sort of like okay the organizations are like let's do something and it's sort of like how how well, where do we where do we go next right yeah yeah there, there is there's so much I guess what I'm hearing what I'm agreeing with is that there's so little done in this space of LGBT inclusion in women, peace and security or in any of the security mechanisms or the humanitarian system, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I think that you're right, there's these individual actors out there or very small groups, um, you know, doing work and 
how do we support each other and how do we, I guess, develop the kind of framework to ensure that the work we're doing kind of develop some kind of best practice because it, it's not actually there yet. There's not enough work that's been done, not enough people practicing it to see what works and what doesn't work. And there's so many particular risks and challenges that we have to face doing the work that we're doing, um, particularly with LGBT people, particularly in conflict or, you know, in emergency situations. Um, and so there's this huge stuff around duty of care, there's huge stuff around do no harm. We know that doing nothing does cre create huge harm as well. Um, you know, it doesn't surprise me, for example, that, you know, in the, in the national security policies, um, you know, with uh, specific mention of LGBT people in Mindanao, um, in their um, women, peace and security, because, you know, uh, trans folks were targeted, they were targeted in that conflict. Um, and so I guess there's so much to be done. I think the thing that, that we're also lacking is is how can INGOs and how can UN system be accountable to um, LGBT CSOs, like in that partnership, mm -hmm. how can, and I'm by no means saying that I have the answers and that I'm perfect, but it's certainly a problem that we've been wrestling with, which is, you know, if you're a big organisation um, and you're not a queer organisation, you have no understanding you know there's very little research to go on even that there's issues here but we know that they are and that we know that this work has to happen how do you yourself internally work to become more inclusive you know in your right. own internal right. structures in your own internal policies you know what bathrooms do you have you know particularly if you're a christian organization um and you know, we know that many Christian organizations work in, in this space. Um, and how yeah, and I think it's culturally also, relevant. Mm. Yeah, it also reminds me of like, um, so I did this talk as part of the queer politics series that um, that Andy Reynolds has been hosting online. And there's really, it's really like runs the gamut. There's like a lot of different, there's like uh, a lot of different speakers from different backgrounds, I think partially because it's online. So they get, they're getting a lot of different researchers together who maybe wouldn't um, necessarily go into the same conference, right? But Paisley Kura talked there and one of the, the comments that he made was sort of like, you know, the question that he gets a lot is like, well, what is the most important thing for trans rights right now? I mean, in the US right now, there's like so much anti-trans legislation going on. So there's, so there's you know, that's in the, in the news. But anyway, he was sort of saying, well, um, we need like housing and healthcare, just like basic human rights or like mm. the tr same. It's it's true for trans people as it is for, you know, any mm. other person. So I think I, you know, I, I think the, you know, we need unions in these in these um, NGOs too, right? So it's hard for me not to, and like as someone who's involved in the union in my in my um, university, I do think that I'm. And when I look at the work of those feminists and those like feminist peace builders that that like really inform how I sort of think about what peace building is, yeah, you, you really do have to be anti-racist and committed to like coalitional work, you know, and that's what like the hmm. work that Karma Chavez writes about where you're talking about like queer mobilizations and bringing together organizations that are hmm. working for, um, I don't know, undocumented folks who are also like queer and, and, you know, the sex worker, like working with sex worker organizations. Um, I think that's where the politics and the best practices can come from. Um, and so in some ways the, you know, not having the, 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 you know, responding to the, to the, having the appropriate bathrooms is about having an organization that like can functionally respond to mm. well what is our policy around xyz <laughs> yeah. and um and and so yeah I, like I, it shouldn't come down to trans folks to be the ones to like resolve that for the organization no, no. So, like, absolutely 
absolutely. <laughs> um, and, and I guess this is my point is that there's right. so much work to be done and there is a responsibility from organisations to do that work internally rather than just go, oh, right. I'm going right. to grab someone and just go out and, and do some work there because yeah. I've been told that, you know, that's where I'm going to get the next bit of funding from. <laughs> it's, a very, it's a very disorienting feeling to be sort of like, yeah, to, to watch when you know, especially, I mean, mm. we have these conversations with people that are like, they know what, like, they know the house hasn't been cleaned up before they're going out to like do this work. And it's, it's very disorienting, this mm. sort of, um, and that's, I think, why a lot of people end up, well, I don't know. I actually don't know how, how the turnover is with, with NGOs, but I do think that a lot of, you know, activists, like a lot of the burnout comes from this sort of like, of course it's exhausting work, but it's exhausting work when you also can't, you know, mm. make the movements within your own organization to be responsive um, mm. to, to these, these challenges, even within your own um, place of work. But um, yeah, so I, I you know, so it's sort of like, um, finding, I think finding the coalitions is so crucial, which is why I do think those spaces where there's alliances between um, feminist organizations, organizations that are working to respond to, you know, um, you know, those organizations that really were set up as like responding to uh, domestic violence and it really was very straight uh, cis, but now there is a real understanding like, okay, we need to be working in coalition and, and actually be thinking about these other dimensions of, of gendered violence. I, I mean, those I think are the spaces that hopefully can learn and, and mm. grow to sort of like be able to be more responsive. But I mean, this stuff, mm. yeah, it's, it's slow going, right? Yeah. <laughs> slow going. How, how much do you think that people, I guess, there's so many assumptions that we make and one assumption that I make all the time is people can see that the violence that say for example a gay man or a bisexual cisgendered man and the violence myself as a cisgendered woman and the violence that say for example a lady might experience is all gendered violence just as is violence against women as we traditionally know it that 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 underlying stuff is all entangled and, and interconnected. Do you think that people, you know, we use the term gender, but in the sector, we know that people think traditional notions of womanhood. When people think gendered violence, do they still just think traditional notions of womanhood? Or do you think that they're starting to see that that, that includes so many different people because it's about violence against a person not adhering to traditional norms of gender. I mean, I think it comes down to, in, in my experience and sort of what I've seen in different spaces is who you're in conversation with. Like, this is why I think, you know, around abortion access, um, mm. people who need abortions, you hear that differently if you are in community with queer organizations that are talking about like not only straight women needing access to abortion. Mm -hmm. At the same time, there's a, there's plenty of people who have a complicated understanding about who needs abortions that still like talk about the percent, you know, the number of women who access abortion. Mm -hmm. And so I think you can use that language um, and and sort of be able to, to use it differently in different contexts if mm -hmm. you're actually you like know trans people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You actually know. Yeah. And and like in some ways, I I, I like laugh to say this because mm. this is the shift and 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 um the important difference that I see. But like of course people are I do think that a lot of people default to I think mm. people who are not around queer organizations are like openly working with people who can talk about mm. the complexity of gender probably do default to um uh, you know, cis assumptions. And, mm. um, but I, mm. I think it, it, it depends on who your community is. I mean, this is just sort of what, I mean, I've seen this in academic spaces. I've seen this in sort of activist spaces that I do think the language you can use and how you understand it and what you mean by it depends yeah. on the community that you're working with and your yeah. ability to mess up and have a conversation that helps you understand it differently. It depends on who's not in the room, who's in yeah. the room, I think, yeah. right? Yeah, no, it, it does. I guess, um, 
you know, when I think about, for example, um, IWAG. Um, so I'm the LGBT subworking a group chair for IWAG, which is SRHR in emergencies. And abortion is, is a really big issue. Um, and yet within an SRHR understanding of emergency and issues, you know, there is absolutely no discussion of abortion being anything other than something that affects cis women or straight cis women. Um, it, you know, doesn't take in, I guess, um, within these spaces, diverse OGS conclusion, which is how I usually frame the word, um, is just a seed still. Um, and that in, not in all places, but in purely kind of more traditional humanitarian spaces, um, just people are surprised. Um, and it's not that they're necessarily um, against it. It's like, oh, I never thought about that before. Yeah, and that to me was a huge shift and how I and how I like, I mean, it's yeah, again, it's definitely gives space to the fact that there are people who are very much against it and very much like yeah. um fight very hard to talk about abortion as only being something that women mm -hmm. experience, right? Um but in a lot of conversations I've had that people are kind of like, wow, I really didn't think about that. I didn't really realize the implications of that. And so I think also in an organization, like you just mentioned, I would be very surprised if there aren't people who are thinking about it in a complicated way, but like, is there a pos is there space at all to respond to that in a way that will be heard? Yeah. And so that, that's, you know, I think as much as I like, of course, don't want like the liberal statement that is kind of like, oh, we're trans inclusive and all of this. And then, you know, it's an absolute mess <laughs> of the actual organization. Like I don't, I'm not wishing for that, but how do you sort of make, make it clear that um, we understand that the way that we've been operating have, has been exclusive and harmful and we're committed and, and here's what we're doing mm -hmm. and, and supporting that. Um, because I, yeah, I, I do think that a lot of the, you know, I, I, cause I would love to be writing about like queer joy and like queer community work. That's like also about mm -hmm. other stuff besides violence. Cause like, obviously we don't live to just talk about violence. Right? Like, no, that's, no. Not, <laughs> that's not all we are, yeah but um, yeah, I think uh, still when so much of it is kind of like, oh yeah, I really didn't think about that. Um, yeah. how, how do we, how do we, move that conversation and I would be curious because I know there's people in the in the um who are listening who have very much been doing this work so I'd be interested I don't know if we can make other people speakers but I'd be curious if anyone wants to sort of share any of their experiences with um navigating that in their work um yeah we can allow people to talk I see the button if anyone um, wants to ask a question to jump in in our in our conversation here if we if I could see your face then but um mm -hmm. Mm. Mm. but yeah I know you had other questions but uh I can't I think, think I am trying I do try to be like a, a bit yeah. generous with the folks that I see like in a position to to use gender more expansively and to um because yeah, I mean, I'm I'm over the whole idea about we need to wait. We can't talk about it. I just don't think that's true. I mean, of course, I think the context, like, listen to the local organizations that they're saying, please don't like, <laughs> please don't put my work on in the headlines. Like, absolutely. But at the same time, um, I don't. I think there's plenty of experiences of of organizations being like, no, they're just saying that they they just see it as too risky to be talking about, you know abortion at all, let alone like the fact that, that, you know, queer and trans people also need to access sexual and reproductive mm -hmm. health care. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I guess that's that backlash towards gender more generally, you know, we right. are seeing a backlash towards even, um, you know, women as we understand traditionally, um, or, or backlash to try and reinforce this notion of this womanhood that rep doesn't represent most of us, regardless of our sexuality right. or gender identity. Um, and, you know, there's, I guess there's, 
there's so much going on. There's so much going on in terms of this big out being something that is a more organized, I think, um, um, I guess, attention to, particularly with women, peace and security. They've done some great work, like they've got their own working group and all sorts of things. There's the SDG um, have got similar things. But, you know, there, there is some stuff happening and there's some space moving forward, even amongst the backlash. Um, I think that, you know, we both agree that there's a, there's a real need to, for solidarity between movements, particularly feminist movements. And also, I think, you know, in lots of places that I work, it's, it's the feminist organisations that often house um, queer people assigned female at birth or, and, and when I say house them, it's, um, you know, often, um, you know, this queer feminist strategies of engagement within communities and, and operating from feminist organisations. Um, and I see that, you know, in all, in all sorts of places. Um, I guess that that solidarity as well of pushing forward against that backlash. And actually, it reminds me, I did a paper on backlash and resistance against women's rights and LGBT rights activists oh, about two years ago now. And um, yeah, there's so much work to be done, but I think that there's some really promising stuff that is happening. Would you agree with that? Yeah, and also I haven't seen it yet, but have you seen the Lesbians Free Everyone documentary that was just I released? Yeah, no. so I haven't seen it. Everyone put it on your calendar. Um, I, I um, know that outright did a screening, but I think um, that the director's organizing other screenings. Um, I mean, I know they are because the film just came out. Um, yeah. And I think that um, in some ways, I think that recognizing this work of like coalition, coalition work with queer organizers, certainly I'm really excited by looking at lesbian feminist organizing, but I think you can find it, you know, you can definitely find it in other coalitional spaces. I think a lot of that work is not the stuff that ends up highlighted in the stories. It's the stuff that like, I get so excited to find out about. And I like want, you know, like I, as I finish my book, and this is becoming my like catchphrase as I finish my book, but I'm going to finish my book. Like yeah. I'm getting excited about the stuff that I did like um, about like the the work on like lesbians travel the roads of feminism globally, like looking at who it is that brought forward, like did say, okay, like LGBT rights or human rights as, you know, mm. as problematic as that can be when taken up in, in, um, homonormative ways right yeah but you know I have sorry no go ahead you know I have a lavender tattooed on me oh. to... <laughs> I, I am it. the lavender menace <laughs> exactly exactly so I'm just I mean I do get energized by you know and I have another book that's sort of about like not sort of it is about like recognizing the the linkages between um war resistance and and just sort of um you know feminist lesbian feminists have definitely been there ma making a mess of it all and i think <laughs> like refusing to say like this is a separate project or something for later and you know that's probably not the thing that's going to get the award in a lot of instances i mean we know this and and um so i think um it, because I and 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 even in a lot of in a lot of cases may not be the right thing to to do the research project about because this is the this is the work of the patient you know in the back rooms negotiating mediating I mean I am thinking about it more in terms of mediating knowing that it's so easy to trade sexuality out and so like who are the people that are helping to to navigate this difficult 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 conversation and mm. um, not always making the right choices. We can certainly like, are, you know, mm. have conversations about that. I, you know, but at the same time, having having not been in those rooms, um, I'm mostly just really curious about how, how people are making those conversations, making those decisions. But um, mm. I, I do think that the people that are at the intersection, you know, we're thinking about like 
lesbian feminists of color being the ones that are like, no, mm-hmm. we need to be thinking about these issues together. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I think that that Lesbians Free Everyone is the film that's really pointing to, I mean, it does look at Beijing as sort of like the, the, yeah. the space to sort of see this activism, not that that's, of course, the only way to look at it, but it is, um, it is also an important uh, uh, date that I'm looking at in terms of sort of where there's visibility of lesbian organizing in global spaces. But that's yeah, I mean, yeah. definitely doesn't. It's a very, it's a very like Western centric, like not, yeah. not that yeah. Even, given the organizers that are in part of it, right? Uh, even yeah, but yeah. it is one of those like organizing spaces that I think. Yeah. It, it is it is a pivotal space happen. and lesbians yeah. were talked about or the inclusion of lesbians were talked about um, ne- um nebrasa's got a question um thank you for this discussion i've been finding that in discussions i've had particularly within the academic space the rights aspect of srhr is constantly ignored or not well understood um, I'm smiling because I agree. People seem yeah. to view gender equality as separate from SRHR, and I wonder if this is because they only see gender as binary. I completely agree with your statement that gender, sex, and sexuality are interlinked, and that's where the rights in SRHR is the most important, in my view. Well, I would be curious for you to speak to that first, and then I'll respond if, if since it sounds uh, like it immediately resonated. <laughs> um, just in terms of that rights aspect, I think within SRHR, you know, there's so much focus on things that are like considered kind of um, the need fixing, um, or you know, like abortion, for example, um, and not thinking about you know, the health and well-being of, or, you know, of, or being able to healthily express your sexuality and how important that is to your rights and, and well-being. And so I guess from that perspective, you know, and, and this is really from a development's perspective, um, that rights is more about, you know, just making sure your needs are met. Rights are about, you know, the healthy expression. Yeah. This is something I've been thinking about in the context of this idea of like practical needs being needing to respond to practical needs first in conflict. This is something that, you know, there's there's various theories and and there's a lot of writing about sort of different organizations in the moment of crisis focusing on those those practical needs first. And mm-hmm. certainly as someone who has had an abortion and is very much in a queer relationship, I'm like, practical needs for who? Like, it's pretty practical for me to like be able to talk about sexuality and, you know, have the communities I'm a part of be visible and prioritized. Like, that's not really something that's that's like something to be considered later, right? Mm-hmm. So I think, um, I do think my immediately my immediate response to this is the fact that people are really still trying to make this um, uh, SRHR not be about sex and sexuality Mm. remarkably because Mm. I think that you can't I think if you if you stick with the complexity of it and actually talk about queer lives then it's requires I think talking about um you know dignity Mm. and um not not everyone's main goal for their sexual rights is to have a child I mean that's not I mean that's an important part of it but that's not Mm. the only you know, not the only dimension of it. So I think um, it is still a hierarchy of like the most important thing is to make sure, you know, the protection of, uh, it it seems to me, the protection of the heteronormative woman from a, you know, violent patriarchal man. Um, But, you know, there's, there's certainly domestic violence within queer relationships and there's all kinds of different families. And I feel like, I feel like this is like, the 101 about LGBTQ human rights, right? But um, mm. I do think this the the SRHR space ends up being the one where it's kind of like, well, it's already so hard to talk about abortion. We can't be talking about queer and trans rights too. I mean, do you get that sense? Even though like the organization that I yeah. see it doing the best work in in in, in Northern Ireland. Um, there's no question that we're talking about both, right? Like it's very clear that, you know, people are need access to abortion no matter what. And that, uh, you know, like, and, and talk about like getting direct service to, to abortions and that like queer people 
uh, also like because you see the linkages it's like it's, it actually mm. is like the worst space to refuse to talk about both at the same time because it's so clearly targeting both like anti-gender uh, politics so clearly target both communities in mm. like around claims about like protecting the family mm. so if there's ever a space to make sure that there's a coalition it's that one and I think the alliance for choice and the work that they put out and like their refusal to like talk about it later despite the fact that there hasn't been access to abortion mm. I, I mean I, I, that's just the example that I I see most evidently mm. but we could point to others and, and maybe I don't know if, if uh, we could definitely point to others but yeah I think it's yeah yeah to to end I guess to answer that second bit for Nebraska from from my perspective yes I do think that it's um you know the the rights discussion or the rights aspect is constantly ignored because by ignoring it, it's much easier to reinforce heteronormativity, cisnormativity, traditional notions of family, and to some degree control, um, you know, sexual and reproductive health and rights. Um, ironically enough, um, but that coming out of my mouth sounded incredibly pessimistic. Um, but that's essentially, I guess, I feel um, particularly. You know, and that's not to say that I think practitioners are trying to do that. I think practitioners are trying to operate in really restricted, limited spaces. But yeah. I think, you know, particularly pressure from different countries and different funders in the UN and how that, you know, that trickles down into what what projects can be funded and how we can run these projects and so forth. Certainly, I think. Yeah. That's the case. I also think it's fairly remarkable how there continues to be so little attention from what I see to femininity. Like, I think that to me also makes mm -hmm. it clear how stuck in a binary we are because like somehow, not we, but you know, <laughs> these spaces we're operating in at times. Um, I think it's interesting that we've gotten to a place where we can like talk about masculinity, but still not talk about queerness. And that we like, because, and so to me, sometimes the way when, uh masculinity is talked about actually is some of the most binary stuff i'm just like oh <laughs> where you see this opportunity <laughs> to sort of break away from this i'm like, in a bubble i don't hear that you know? stuff i'm really yeah. glad <laughs> yeah yeah oh well I, certainly in i think a lot of academic spaces because there is the sort of yeah i mean i don't know hopefully hopefully it's different in different spaces i'm glad if it is but like um i think not understanding that talking beyond a binary matters even for head people which is why i think mm -hmm. there is still being stuck in this binary because not actually seeing that it matters to have a yeah. more fluid understanding about sexuality even for straight people you know <laughs> like um you know i think finding the ways to to you know, not just like, oh, you should also care about how your work impacts queer people, but also like this matters to understanding uh, sexuality and gender, even for, for people who are, you know, fall squarely, fairly squarely into what would be considered a binary representation of, of gender. Mm -hmm. um, and so I don't know, I think that that's the work to, to me, that's the work too. Mm -hmm. um of, of sort of like why why if you're not seeing that well let, let's have this conversation you know mm. I think the other thing for me is um when you break outside of that binary well I guess the implications of what that binary has particularly in the way that resources are distributed in humanitarian situations and in, in conflict situations. So when you have distribution of resources, you you know, they're thinking about particular households and they're thinking about a household as a, a man and woman and children. They're thinking about food distribution lines as, as men and women. They're building, you know, temporary shelters um, for families, for example. Um, and so when you don't fit into that and a really common, you know, we know kind of common ideas of who doesn't fit into that, lesbian women, you know, as, as being acknowledged as a family unit, um, gay men as being acknowledged as a family unit, um, households of trans women being acknowledged as a family unit, but also, you know, households of people with disabilities. Um, I've done a lot of work in, in disability inclusion in the past and, you know, in, in lots of communities, 
because of all sorts of reasons, um, living in communal communal homes. And again, you know, exactly the same issues come up there. And I think that I'm solely focused and EdgeFX work is solely focused on diverse OGS or LGBTIQ+. But when we think about these other things, we get to start to see, you know, there's so much diversity in LGBTIQ+, or diverse OGS, but also people are whole people and they have all of these other things going on. And if we if we just got rid of that heteronormativity and that cisnormativity and, and those barriers, it's actually not just LGBT people that would benefit from that. The whole of society would. That's a good That's way to I was trying to say you said it perfectly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And I think also that if you focus on providing care to say um, people living with disabilities or queer families first and sort of see like how how do we best serve these populations it does actually do really well to help you see how to serve more broadly the communities yeah. that you want to um, be supporting, right? Like that's, I feel like we say this and it's true. We know this yeah. is true. <laughs> so, but yeah. I think the logic of sort of like, well, this is a not a very big part of our population. So therefore we don't have to necessarily prioritize how, how we serve these communities. Like, I don't know, uh, stop, you've heard this one before. Um, <laughs> is sort of how we, we get in or how responses can kind of get in this rut that are like, oh, and then we'll like deal with this problem later, mm. which is an unfortunate way to, to view um, thinking more intersectionally, right? Um, to, yeah. to, I think to bring in the word that we've now seen get included in a lot of documents, <laughs> but would like to actually see, you know, one way to potentially actually be intersectional would be to prioritize that response at the beginning rather than the yeah. end, right? Well, um, pre-emergency pre marginalization, that's why it's important for development right, organizations right. to be doing this work. Yeah. Pre-emergency marginalization. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Of course, it doesn't work for, you know, places like, say, um, Cox's Bazaar or, you know, the refugee camps in Kenya and so forth, because they're long term. But, you know, it's about working with communities in the long term to be able right. to adjust the way in which we interact with that community in a really specific culturally local way so that if a need arises we can actually just work with them and, and meet their needs and that's that's what we're meant to be there for it should be that simple right yeah <laughs> I'm, I'm curious what the response is when you say that in your training <laughs> but um, I never say that in my training okay. <laughs> I don't think <laughs> I think that's just my brain going you know that's how it's meant to be why can't it yeah. be like that? <laughs> but I mean, your point about, I mean, I actually haven't heard it or read about it being articulated like that, though. Um, that's on yeah. me if that's something that's commonly used in emergency or humanitarian emergency response. But um, that makes a lot of sense in the way that I'm thinking about it here in Northern Ireland or in some of the spaces that I'm working in is sort of like... Mm -hmm calling like sort of saying organizations or if folks who are experiencing crisis before the crisis you know mm. um yeah and you know constantly reminding people that like people aren't just like born into this crisis you know it's something that's being reproduced and in order to respond to that crisis means rethinking um what how folks are being marginalized um so mm -hmm. yeah absolutely absolutely and on that bright note <laughs> Yeah, on that uh, right now, I'm going to thank you so much for your time yeah. and energy. Um, I had a Rip Rowan discussion, as we always do, and I'm always so grateful for them. Um, so thank you for joining me once again for a chat this time um, with people, and we'll be putting it up on YouTube tomorrow. Um, and if... Anna can put up the slide um, we have next and uh, one next month um, and oh there we are um, ah with Miriam Casey Maslin um, from CDAC on communicating diverse OGS populations in disaster um, and I'll see you around yeah thank you so much for um, organizing this series and inviting me to talk and um, much more to be discussed. And if anyone wants to um, drop me a message, um, those of you who I don't already know, I'm going to put my email in Absolutely. the chat. 
um, because yeah, these are these are you know ongoing conversations, and and we're really I'm just really happy to see um, a space to to dig into this a bit more, and um, yeah, let's keep working together. <laughs> Thanks, everyone.